Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home. I'm Janelle Riley from Variety. The SAG After Foundation has a COVID-19 relief fund to support SAG After artists during this time. Information on how you can support the effort can be found in the description of this video. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the cast of Killing Eleanor. Please welcome Betsy Brandt, Jenny O'Hara, Jane Kazmarek, and Annika Marks. Thank you all so much for being here. Our pleasure. Thank for you. Having us. Yes. For having us. Yeah. Of course. Four wonderful, powerful women. I am excited for this. Um, <laughs> but because this is an audience of SAG after actors, I actually always like to start at the beginning and ask, how did you get your SAG card? It was a commercial. Oh, for what? For what? For some kind of shampoo. And I was in the shower with wet hair for hours. It's freezing. Oh. But you know, it was money in the bank and it was so good. Betsy, what about for you? Um, also a commercial for Sears. Um, Sears at the time, they were trying to promote uh, their service services. So it was um, come see the service side of Sears. And we were at a wedding and I was a bridesmaid and the air conditioning broke. What would you do? You can't have the bride be sweaty, but don't worry. Sears is going to come out and fix that air conditioning. Then everybody's going to have a great time and the flower girl's going to make a mess. Um, they tapped Heartlead me. And that's how I got my card. And I was, um, just to piggyback onto Jenny's story, I was doing a play. I was the mute in the Fantastics at the time, <laughs> which was also my first equity gig. I was right out of college. And um, I would pray, pray, pray that I would get out of the SAG commercial to be in time for, you know, at the theater for Fight Call. So <laughs> I do my other job, but man, was I thankful for that money from that commercial. It really um, helped with uh, my equity job. It was tremendous. Wow. The commercial, the commercial industry oh my God. for all of us was tremendous of that kind. It yeah. just kept you afloat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jane, what about for you? I had just left drama school and come to Los Angeles and it was an audition for a TV movie called For Lovers Only to play a 17 year old Italian virgin. Um, was that a stretch? Yeah. <laughs> <Huh. Whoa. laughs> <laughs> and I can't Sorry. believe, I'm like, you're kidding me, you're gonna give me this? But I think I had just come out of drama school with a lot of confidence and thought, well, of course, why shouldn't I be a 17 year old virgin, <laughs> Italian virgin? And my, I, was, I was married to Bobby, the guy from, uh, um, welcome back, Cotter. Uh, Bobby, oh, wow. kind of a curly, and this is, it was 1982, so it was um, Gary Sandy and um, uh, Andy Griffith. Oh, wow. And a whole bunch of people from WKRP in Cincinnati. And it was in a, a Pocono Love Resort, and we were in a heart shaped bathtub. It was so, but I, I, and I remember trying to be very serious because everyone was on the set all the time. We filled it at the Pocono, one of these love hotel, these motels for honeymooners. And I just didn't want to look like I wasn't taking it seriously. So I would stay in my room, you know, going over my lines all the time. Cause I thought if I hang out on the set with the rest of the cast, it'll look like I'm not taking it seriously. <laughs> because in theater, right? In theater, That's you were right. always- That's right. That was a big difference between theater and TV movies with Andy Griffith. <laughs> That was a good beginning. <laughs> yeah. I'm imagining Anna Jane not talking to everybody while she's on set and I can't get there. that. I can't actually I can't imagine at all. <laughs> Jane, Jane playing the mute in the Fantastics just would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> I someone said I can talk to deaf people. And I thought <laughs> I've done that. You're like, I've done that. <laughs> yeah, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> Annika, what about for you? I actually was doing background work and I got upgraded on uh, Law and Order, which is Law really interesting. Order. I have to say, and I say this as often as I can, I mean, background work, like I actually didn't do the commercial thing. That wasn't my way in. I was right out of Circle in the Square in New York and just trying to make, you know, a living and, and stay afloat and um, carve out enough time to go to the equity building, to stand in line, you know, starting at four in the morning to go do the open calls. And like in putting all those pieces together, I discovered background work. And I have to say, like coming out of theater school where I had learned so much about the discipline of, you know, 
of, of, of the craft, I knew nothing about a film set at all. Um, and I, yeah. I did a ton of background work and a ton of stand in work. And I kind of feel like that was my film school in a way, because I would just hang out on the periphery and watch. Um, and then I was lucky enough that in one of those moments, I was just the right height, probably, you know, and got plucked out of a crowd to do something and, and, and got a chance. But um, I always say that like having the humility to do that work um, out of school was just, it was like going to grad school for free or something, or getting paid to go to grad school, you know, just watching mm -hmm. people who were experts at something I knew nothing about. And now you are an expert. Now you're all here today with Killing Eleanor, uh, which stretch, just won. But... Yes, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just won the best narrative feature at the SCAD Savannah Film Festival. A huge honor. It's so amazing. Um, I want to go back to the beginning and, and start with Annika because you're also the writer of this film. Yes. And I'm curious, what prompted you to write the story? And did you always know you would play Natalie? So I, I had the idea in my head for a very long time. Um, I I was subletting an apartment from an older lady, uh, like a snowbird in New York who went to Florida for the winters. And I was getting out of her apartment for six months and I was 21 years old. And this is in that time that I was doing background work and trying to put all the pieces together. And, and I never lived anywhere more, longer than six months. Um, and she had a yellow legal pad that she'd handwritten a lease on. And at the very end, before I signed the lease, she said, you know, unless you want to agree to help kill me when I'm ready to go, in which case you could have the place for free. And obviously that I didn't take the deal. I, I, I paid her and um, what do you mean that obviously? was that. <laughs> I taken the deal. Well, in, I, I mean, I, I, I considered it. And I spent a lot of time afterwards <laughs> thinking, you know, just to just to say that out loud was so striking yeah. to me that I just never stopped thinking about her. And mm -hmm. I never stopped thinking about being at that place where you're getting older and maybe you're alone and who would be, who is this person who might ask that of a relative stranger. Um, so that's Eleanor was in my head for a very long time kind of formulating um, and jump forward a bunch of years I was doing a play with Jenny um, and I, I mean Jenny is extraordinary everybody who has ever seen her work knows that and um, I said to her. So I, in a dressing room that I trapped her in. Listen, I, I have this idea um, for this movie and I wanna write it and I want us to, do, to make it together. And she said, uh, yeah, sure, go ahead, write the movie, I'm, I'm, sounds good. <laughs> and then, it, and then it, to be fair, it took me 10 years to write it. Um, and 10 years later, uh, I had met my husband who is a director and, um, came you know i if i came at at writing and filmmaking from the actor perspective and i always sort of say like through the back door uh he came at it r r straight on he went to film school and he had a real discipline around writing and filmmaking and um and i feel like you know he just he just looked at me and said you have all the pieces uh you just need to sit down and do it so i did mm -hmm. and i was lucky enough that it happened at a time in my life when i had access to jane and betsy and all these extraordinary actors and um and as far as knowing I would always play Natalie, um, I wanted to. I would have given the role up. I, I, I was never, ever willing to consider anybody else for Eleanor except Jenny. Um, so yeah. I said from the very beginning, if one of us needs to go to get a bigger name into this film, into one of these lead roles, then it should be me because I don't know anybody else who can play Eleanor. And I do know other actors who could play Natalie, even though selfishly I wanted to do it. <laughs> right. Well, I don't. Uh, I'm so glad you played it. Um, and this is the, the casting of this movie I love because as you alluded to, you you all, you knew all of these actors. Um, and I love that you've sort of collected people over the years and sort of made your own little theater troupe here. Um, so for the actors, uh, what attracted you to the project aside from Annika and uh, and specifically these roles? I mean, Jenny, for you, you know, being told I'm writing something for you, maybe you hear that a lot and it doesn't pan out, but yeah, I'm just it's to be amazing. Say, yeah, yeah, oh, good, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then 10 years later, a phone call, it's done. What's done? Oh, you know, I, the thing I was writing, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a movie now. Oh, good. I want you to read it. Okay. <laughs> So I read and thought, Annika, this is fucking brilliant. <laughs> this is stunning. This is, it's amazing. It is amazing. And Annika, you are amazing in it. And working with you, it's like butter. You just, just 
call and response, call and response, call and response. Doesn't take any work at all. And thank you. What a gift you've given me. You're the gift, but we can yeah. go back to that later. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, you guys. We can do it on our own. <laughs> I know. Uh, Jane, what dressing room well, did Annika it, corner you in? I did corner you. Oh, I did. I did. Uh, well, we were... We we were working on a wonderful production of Our Town with Jeff West Theater. And Annika came at the last minute to replace uh, one, another actress. And the minute she opened her mouth at the read through or started speaking um, an American Sign Language, which she did both in the play, I just zeroed in on her and thought, I want to work with that girl. I want her to play my daughter. I want to, something. It was just one of those immediate things. And we had, it was a challenging play. We developed a wonderful friendship during it. And then she brought up, would you like to read this? And you think, oh, you wrote it just like Jenny. <laughs> you know, good luck with that. Um, and she handed me this script and I don't know, it got in a pile of something. And I was on an airplane several weeks later, probably months later. And I had it and I thought, okay, let's read this. I was like, I know I didn't have any reception on the plane, but I was emailing her knowing that the minute the plane landed, the email would go off. So it would be all set to go when we landed saying, this is an amazing script. I need, I need to be part of this. I want to be part of this. Please, I hope you didn't give the part away already because I've been so sluggish in getting back to you. But um, it was that, it was that good on the page. And knowing Annika and knowing the rest of the people that she had surrounded in doing this project. It was just one of those things that it was just a no brainer. And I am still raising kids and I work as little as possible <laughs> unless something is, is this good. And that I know what a positive experience it's going to be because of the other people um, involved. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do now. And I was so lucky to have this. Annika was a friend and know Becky and Jenny and everything. So this was just a delight. I, I have to tell, I'll tell a quick Jane story, which is that I was working, I was doing a show with Donald Margulies, who had worked with Jane very, you know, on several projects, I think. And in our very first rehearsal, he said to me, you know who you remind me of? You're like, you're, you're Jane Kaczmarek. And I said, oh my God, Donald, that is, that is the nicest compliment. That is the best compliment anybody has ever given me. You don't understand what a fan I am of this woman. I think she's brilliant. I've seen her on stage a million times. I, I would watch her do anything. And then within you know, a couple years where I'm lucky enough to do a play with her, which is one of those incredible things about being an actor that you have those, you have that, I had that feeling about the exact same feeling about Betsy. I mean, getting to yeah. Betsy for this role, I went through our mutual friend, Tommy Sadowski, who was playing her brother on a TV series. And I wrote this impassioned letter to Betsy because I can remember watching the first season of Breaking Bad and thinking, she is, she is the star of this show. Like every, th every single Everybody moment. Said so. Everybody <laughs> said so. I carried that, you know. A hundred percent. Cranston doing, Jane. I know. Like, I know. Like, there? Is he not there? Um, I don't yeah. know. I felt the same way about you because um, Tommy and I were at uh, our town opening night, which was amazing. And I remember I just what was happening in the world and I said to Tommy I needed to see that play tonight and I needed to see it with him I needed him to be there when I saw it and to have that experience together and he told me he was friends with you and I was like oh she's good like how <laughs> have I so I was already kind of like fangirling over you and then <laughs> you and then you you sent me this very sweet email and you said I wrote this for ro this role for you. I don't even usually believe that when someone tells me that, but I didn't care. I just really wanted to. The the role was so great, but the project was really great. And just to work with these this group of actors. I mean, out of the people you know our group, we know you really were the only one I hadn't worked with. Like I had done smaller projects with um, Jenny and I did a workshop at South Coast and. Jane and I were in a room together for a, a week working on a Lee Blessing play. It's a Lee Blessing I, play, yeah. Tommy and I worked together and um, I was just like, yeah, yeah, I'll go to Chicago to, to do this. Like, yes, and it's such a good movie. It's such a good, such a good script. Like, it was a, a pleasure. I will say about the casting process, because you brought this up too, Janelle, is that we didn't have a casting director. I mean, it was it was one of, you know, I think, I think if you're going to go make... Here. 
I was me. If you're going to go make a film and you, you got to kind of look at your advantages. And I knew that my primary advantage was the 20 years of acting that I'd done and this community that I'd built of in all theater actors, right? Everybody came yeah. from theater. And I knew what the, I knew we needed that kind of actor on this set. We were going to move really fast. We needed actors to show up with choices, ready to play um, actors who, you know, who aren't, motivated by ego and those that's not the actor that does theater there is no there's no room for that in theater so i i knew i knew at every single person that i wanted for every single role is the person that played that role and that is the honest to god truth um and that i don't know that that'll ever happen in my life again it's really special and i want to say was, to jane that um i saw you i saw um our town but i also i think the first time i ever saw your work was in the kinder train is that oh, kid, oh transport. kinder transport kinder transport yeah. and it was uh, yeah. devastating it tore my heart out and stomped on it yeah oh. thank you you yeah. know that that was a kinder transport about the you know uh, a mother surviving the camps and going back to get her kid but i think of all the research i did about children in the holocaust how long before you died i didn't have kids then and when i finally had kids i really considered getting hypnotized to get that out of my head because i think as actresses we have this thing where oh i want to give my sophie's choice i want to fill myself with the pain of these characters but in actuality and i think as we grow older you think i don't want to go there i don't want to yeah. think about things as horrible as that yeah <laughs> i don't know where that came from but um you know I actually am curious about that because this film, uh, among many things, you know, it tackles issues of addiction and, and the right to die. And uh, how did you go about researching and, and preparing for these parts? And, you know, is it ever hard? Do you, do you take that work home with you at the end of the day? Jenny, especially for you, because as, as Eleanor, you're, you're playing someone who is dying, but, you know, also grappling with a, a lot of other issues. Well, the thing about Eleanor is she's so filled with life. She's so driven for the thing that she needs. She's so clear about what she needs, about what she wants. My 103-year-old mother died about a week ago. And, and she died in the way that Eleanor would not have wanted to go. Bed bound, diapers, not really there, care under care all the time. And I thought that makes sense. I mean, she was, the way you wrote her, Annika, she is so clear it's making me cry and she's so right about what's right for her and her tenacity and yours because that character just kept driving us through and we kept hitting right angles <laughs> yeah. go right go left whatever but for both of us the stakes were very clear and and i thought you are just wonderful in it that's wonderful. So grateful. Annika, for you, playing someone who's, you know, a recovering addict, um, I'm really curious about the research that went into that. Yeah, so, I mean, I, 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 on the one hand, as a writer write, writing these things, there's a real catharsis in it, right? Because you take these things that you're obviously thinking about in your life. I mean, I watched m my grandfather, who was a, you know, a doctor on the front lines of World War II and was sort of the... I, that iconic, strong, silent type. I, I watched him deteriorate from a degenerative disease that just left him completely dependent on other people. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I felt like writing this allowed a catharsis in me. And I feel the same thing about the addiction. I have addiction in my family. Um, and addiction is a family disease, which is to me one of the central themes of this film that I was really set on exploring. Um, and I'm part of a family that has disease, you know, there's a disease right at the center of it. And in in getting to, I mean, I did do a, a huge amount of research on top of what I just know through living it, which was I went to tons of open meetings and all, you know, and talked to as many people as I could possibly talk to. Um, but I have to say that there's something in the work that we do, um, it allows us, I think, to heal. And I don't mean to say that we use our work as therapy. That's that's not what I mean at all. But I think it lets 
there's something really beautiful about getting to walk all the way through. Like, I, I don't think that Natalie at the end is sober, right? I don't think we take her all the way there. I think we take her to a place of surrender and a place of acceptance and where she goes from there. I, I didn't I didn't write that story. I don't know. I, I know what I hope for her. Um, I know I know where we take Eleanor um, and that felt Honestly, to me, that felt like a celebration. You know, I, I don't think there's a tragedy in this film. I, 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 to me, one of our problems, our central problems around death is that we only know how to view it as a tragedy. And so I, to me, the empowerment that we're able to give both of these characters at the end doesn't make it, doesn't make it, you know, traumatic. I think it, anyway, anyway to me, it felt like, it felt very healing actually to walk through this. It's healing to watch it. in in. Not that, you know, I have the same history as you, but it's like to watch Jenny's character, to watch Eleanor still give, be giving at the end of her life. And that's what she wants to do. And it's such a gift she gives to you, this rebirth. It's, it's, it's beautiful. I wept when you say, when Jenny says, you're not a monster. And mm -hmm. when I see you receive it, it's like, it was such a beautiful moment, just like, perfect it's perfectly done and betsy and jane I'm, I'm so happy that someone cast you as mother and daughter since <laughs> since you both carried brian cranston on series oh my um, god i've been uh, I, wanting to see you together still hurts <laughs> oh, that god. still yeah, right like, now. Uh, oh. <laughs> i send him checks i so, i know you do too <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> we did text him from the set because <laughs> And I had a moment where I said, now we easily could be playing sisters also, but Hollywood, God love Hollywood, right? I'm like, so Brian played my brother-in-law and he played your spouse and so you're my, hang on. <laughs> well, I think it's ever since Angela Lansbury played Lawrence Harvey's mother in The Manchurian Candidate. And I think she was two years younger than he was. <laughs> Oh, but no. I'm comfortable. I play mother. I'm very comfortable playing mothers. And I guess, you know, give me that Betsy Brand again. Um, yeah, I was happy. You to... know, it's it it funny in our generation because I still, I'm, I'm going to be 65, and I, I still think that I look and act and am a contemporary of Betsy and Annika's. Because when you are working on something together, you, you're, the friendship becomes of a contemporary, of a peer. Yeah. You know? And then you get into these parts and think, oh, I, I am old enough to play their mothers and maybe I should start acting like one. Yeah, but it's also, that's, also <laughs> that's a gift you have, Jane, too. And this is part of like what makes you, I mean, clearly your skill and your talent makes you amazing, but it's also who you are. Like, I remember after, I think we had already worked together. And when I saw you, you introduced yourself to me and I was like, <laughs> What are you doing? We like, and and also you know that you're Jane Kaczmarek, right? But I get it. I'm also a Polish kid from the Midwest, right? Who no one knows who I am. And you I think I've ever I, seen I know. Do anything. And you don't want to make anyone uncomfortable, so you think I'll introduce myself, so you know that they might not be comfortable asking what might is something. But it is. It's yeah. that very funny thing of also if. You never think anybody knows who you are. Yeah. Right. Never. I. Yeah. I am always surprised when someone recognizes me from something. Always. Yeah. Right. Um, what What do they usually want to talk to you about? Is it Malcolm in the Middle? Oh, sure. Except yeah. I have a wonderful plumber in uh, Northwest Connecticut <laughs> who said to me he was coming to fix something. He said, "You're an yeah, actress." Yeah. Yeah. Mark. Mark <laughs> used to cause his name. And he said, you're an actress, aren't you? And I said, yeah, yeah, I am. And he said, um, I had just done an episode of Big Bang Theory or something. And I said, no, no. And I said, no. He said, no, Selected Shorts. You read on Selected Shorts. Selected Shorts is a, like a PBS radio show where actors read short stories. Oh and it's a plumber in Northwest Connecticut. Yeah. He said, I always listen to select, uh, Selected Shorts and I recognized your voice. That was oh. amazing. I because love usually that. it's not. I love that. And I think, how do you recognize my hair is white? I wear glasses, but people will say, you know, their heads spin around <laughs> because <laughs> of their voice. They recognize me from my voice.
Well, I love that. About introducing yourself. Yeah. Give the other person a chance to say, I know. Uh, you know, uh. you know. <laughs> Or to say, oh, of course, of course, or I remember, you know, but I, because the, the opposite is horrible. When someone comes up oh. to you and says, hi, and you think I have, I know I should know, and I have oh, no oh. idea what her yeah. name is, you know, it's just, I it's always, I, I try it with my husband. I say, oh, hi, hi, how are you? And you know, my husband, Nick, and they say, hi. <laughs> they don't Can you believe, Jenny? And how many times when you go in and you say, listen, if I don't say anything, it's because I don't remember their name. So okay. introduce yourself. yourself. And that's exactly, hi mm -hmm. Nick, that they don't say their name. Smart, <laughs> smart. <laughs> um, this film is made on an independent budget um, and yet you're shooting in multiple locations. It's a road trip movie. Um, what was the most challenging part? Uh, it, I'm, I'm guessing you probably had fun on set, but I'm guessing it was also very challenging. It was really challenging. Um, we, I did not write a movie to be shot in 17 days. I mean, you know, I, it, this is, there were 31 locations. There were 30 actors. Um, it was, it was a massive undertaking. Uh, I have to give all the credit here to uh, my husband who directed it, who is who comes from music videos and television and works incredibly quickly and is the most prepared director I've ever worked with. Um, and then equally significant, our first AD, Jen Wilkinson, um, who is one of the best first ADs out there, just did Utopia for Amazon and came off of Dear White People and Glow, and she, she's phenomenal, came to do this film. Um, and without her, I don't actually know if we would have made this. All. I think we may have ended up having to cut scenes to, to make it all work. And mm -hmm. she kept this train moving, but kept it moving with so much grace and so much love. And I know actively mentored the crew, you know, she has, she has brought people from that set out to LA to work on sets that she's worked on since. Um, and it might be the thing I'm proudest of with this film is that it really did feel like a community. I remember Jane saying at the end when she was leaving set the last day, she said, you know, I never wanted trailer again. <laughs> I thought, oh, we have won. <laughs> It was like having a green room. It was, you know, we had a toilet we all shared. Yeah. There was, there was one scene we, I had to make a change. Do you remember this? The costume the change and it was near the bridge. And we went into oh, yeah. a Starbucks and I went in wearing clothing and I came out wearing a hospital gown with big girl panties sticking out the back. Oh yeah. No, oh yeah. It was, it was, Oh yeah, right on the other side of the bridge. And at that point we had gone down to a four person crew because we were doing second unit. We did like two days of second unit. We actually did the road trip and and you were in the Starbucks changing into your hospital gown. And Jess, our DP was sitting there with the, her giant camera on her shoulder. And we were, you know, we looked like, a, I don't know. We, I don't know, no one knew what we were. Nobody bad at night. It was amazing. Amazing. Oh but my God, and then I sat amazing. down, I sat down in the Starbucks and gave you bruises under your eyes. I sat there with the makeup. I had a picture. Martina, our makeup artist, had sent me with a picture. So I'm sitting here trying to give her just the right amount of bruising under her eyes. Wow. Well, she's sitting there with her underwear hanging out of her hospital gown. It was, yeah, yeah. indie film. You know, I think the thing <laughs> that was so important to making this cast and crew feel at home was Aunt, uh, Annika's mother and father did craft service. Yeah. Our yeah. mother that. was always walking around with cookies or with, a, with hot soup. And this was <laughs> remarkable. Her sisters, we, it was like some family reunion with a family you didn't know before. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> loved, loved, loved. I'm obsessed with Annika's mom and dad. I, me, like, too. Like, me too. Oh, it was I was never wanted to talk to a craft service lady more. I <laughs> all I wanted to do was talk to your mother. I know. I really try to take credit for how lovely the set was, but all the credit actually goes to my parents. <laughs> well, that's, well, listen, I think you deserve a lot of it. It, it was, it was so lovely. And then for us, like it really, it did feel so, so theater like after, and you know, we shot this, I, I, I you know, did one day we, we shot this um, long scene, which thank 10 pages. Thank God, like with a lot of people, I, I know 
it's a bear to shoot those scenes, but man, I love doing them. Yeah, and I did too. They always turn out so well. And be and there was so much give and take. It was, it was like being on on stage together. Yeah. And it was amazing. And it was, it was, you know, we had such a blast doing it. And I, you know, was incredibly happy with the work we did. And then just to sit around with all of you at night after. Like I, I, right. I I could have done another week. I mean, I did my other job. <laughs> another day. You could have done another <laughs> day. See me after this, and I would have stayed. <laughs> and that and that day, I mean, we had ten pages to shoot, and you know, talk about why you need theater actors on a set like this. Mm -hmm. It was it was a group of we we did we rehearsed it in we we never shot pieces of it. You know, we shot that entire yeah. scene. Um, we never we never set up on people to say, okay, this is your take. This is your. It was always everybody's take. You were never quite sure where the camera was going to be, and we had a group of actors that was that generous that was always going to show up whether they thought the camera was on them or not and that's what pulling a day off like that takes um, and we we had mm -hmm. the cast to do it I was thinking um it's rare honestly to find like a film with like a good female role let alone two female lead roles let alone you have this amazing female cast Cameron Mannheim also appears in a wonderful scene um did it feel unusual to you on set um or has that been your experience in the past now that you mention it <laughs> and it felt wonderful it was just wonderful easy peasy yeah there was you mean having, do you mean having so many women on the set or women, yeah. good women's roles in prominent roles yeah Actually, I did a little movie for Netflix a while ago, and it was uh, the the cast, the crew was all with all women in these uh, roles of great um, technical efficiency. Oh wow! And I, it was heaven because I think of all the times you kind of walk out and you got the sound guy or something, you think, oh, I wonder if he thinks I look fat in his jeans. When you're surrounded by all women crews. I was completely void of any of the um, the beating up I do to myself about my physical being that I realized I do in a crew that's all men. I wasn't we so we did have you know obviously I I I realize I am more interested in women I just am and I and I want to write female roles and I I it's why we need people to write their own stories because we just see the world through our perspectives and I'm I I fascinated by men too, but I'm really fascinated by women. So the fact that it turned out to be a script with so many female characters was not surprising to anybody in my life. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that I think is is really worth, you know, mentioning is that 60% of our uh, department heads were female. And I think it's really important to say that we weren't, we weren't going out there trying to hire women in you know, powerful positions behind the scenes. We didn't have a mandate. It wasn't part of our, you know, incentive or our budget or anything like that. Um, we were looking for the best person for the job. The difference I think is that there were women doing the hiring. And so sometimes mm -hmm. I think people, the people doing the hiring have certain blind spots or doubt the qualifications of perfectly qualified candidates standing in front of them. And there were none of those blocks there. And with those blocks lifted, we ended up with this really, you know, very split. I mean, our, our crew is about 50-50, but 60% of our powerful positions behind the scenes, our leadership positions were women um, based purely on their on their merit. And so I'm, I'm really, I'm really proud of that. But I also think it's important to say we weren't gunning for it. It just yeah. happened because yeah. we could see their we could see their talent, you know, we weren't blinded to it for whatever, for whatever reasons people end up blinded I'm, to I'm really, I'm really thankful that you said that because I sometimes, listen, I'm, I'm all for hiring more women because God knows like how many jobs did I do in LA before I worked with a female director, you know, right. behind the camera. Like, um, so, but I, I love that it, it's, there was no mandate there was no because you know there are certainly people that would exploit that and say yeah. well you know that's why you had all these women i mean there probably was more qualified men it's like no no no. we just gave everybody a fair chance and this is how it landed this is how it shook right. out and it worked so well like yeah. i'll give you an example we we our production designer it was her first feature that she production designed she was by far the most qualified person we talked to. She was phenomenal. She hired her crew. She hired an yeah. all-female crew. And they were 
phenomenal. And it was, it's like, yeah, there are these pathways, right? And you're not necessarily, it's, it's, we, we did give her a chance and she stepped up in a way that, I mean, I mean, talk about, talk about challenging 17 days in 31 locations. She, she made all that happen, right? She, she, yeah. she worked magic on not enough money <laughs> and, um, and yeah. And, and the people that she worked with, the people that she trusted all happened to be women. So anyway, so we, we, we benefited from her not having those blind spots in, in yeah. who she hired and yeah, it's like a trickle down effect. So a week ago today, you won the top prize at the SCAD Savannah Film Festival, Best Narrative Feature. Um, and I think what everyone wants to know is uh, where can we see this movie? When can we see it? What are the plans for it? So next, we're, we're, we're playing the St. Louis Film Festival. Um, it's a, it's a geo-blocked festival, so it's available in Missouri and Illinois. Um, but we are available, start, you know, starting yesterday, I think, we're available for a, a few weeks. So you can find us there if you are in one of those two states. Um, we've been nominated for their, they have this award called the Emerging Director Award. So we're one of five films, or I should say Rich is one of five directors nominated for that. And we're, we're really honored by that as well. Um, um, and then we've been asked to play a couple other festivals now that people have gotten to see the film. So I think we'll, we'll, we, we will certainly be playing a few others and we'll be announcing those soon. Um, as far as distribution goes, we're looking at a few options right now. We haven't settled on one yet, but I think we're close. So we're hoping to just use this momentum and roll it into a release. Um, we're in that place now where it's the, it's the balance between being realistic, but also not being impatient. And we're, we're hopefully striking that balance um, correctly. Uh, I am very excited for everyone to see this movie. Please do seek it out. And on behalf of the SAG After Foundation, thank you all so much for being here today to share your experiences and your stories and your talent. Thank you for joining us.